OFS, I'm Doug Shapiro. This is the Imagine a Place podcast, where we explore the power of place and the role of design in our lives. When you think of what it means to change perspective, we often don't think of it in its literal sense. But for Malcolm Berg, in order to change his perspective, he had to literally change perspective. It wasn't until he was zooming towards the ground in an aerobatic aircraft that he understood architecture in a fundamentally new way. Malcolm Berg is an award-winning architect and designer who leads his firm out of Miami, the EOA Group. He was recently selected as IIDA's Hospitality Designer of the Year. And today, Malcolm delivers some awesome advice around passion and enthusiasm and how a deeper understanding of your profession can set you apart. When I was a young kid in Argentina, um, my uh, my father used to build houses. He, he built one house every year. And before he would turn it over to the to the owners, we actually would um, would spend a month there. We'd go and uh, you know, as a family with kids, um, we'd spend our summers at these uh, sort of beach houses, and they were all raw. You could smell the concrete, you could smell the 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 the, the paint curing and drying, and you know, there were live wires everywhere. So I'd, I'd get mildly electrocuted every other year. <laughs> Didn't affect me a bit or my behavior, by the way. Um, so, so it was a great way to grow up. It was, it was, uh, it was sort of adventurous and, 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 uh, and unfinished and gritty. And I remember to this day, the grit and the smell of the concrete, the smell of the paint and the smell of the, of the pine and the raw wood uh, and the plywood. And it's, it's a beautiful sort of uh, um, guttural architectural feeling. Um, which is which is really quite terrific. So we did that every year, but you know we had to we had to drive quite a few hours to these little vacation homes from from Buenos Aires. At a very young age, I came up with I came up I, I had this recurring dream of picking up a cardboard box, and this I might have been four or five years old when this recurring dream was taking place. And I grabbed that cardboard box and I tuck it under my arms. And I'd lean forward just a bit. I would, I would levitate off the ground. I didn't know the word hover at the time, but I would just levitate off the ground about a meter off the, off the ground. And it could take me wherever I wanted to go. I would just point mm. my little cardboard box somewhere and it would take me there. And one of the places that I would always go back to were these unfinished houses. So there was something very uh, destination oriented to, uh, to these houses. And the fact that they were unfinished made them even so much more pure. They had, they had yet to be tainted by time or use or, or people. They were just raw. Um, so, so that was my first sort of combination of architecture and, and, uh, and, and hovering or lightness of being and, and you know, getting, getting above, uh, above the ground. Uh, and maybe maybe there was a little escapism in there as well, trying to trying to get mm. away from whatever I had uh, more locally, um, and 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 you know taking my own path essentially. So fast forward many years, when I got into graduate school, um, I went straight for a master's of architecture, um, and that was at uh, at Harvard. It was a very very intense three and a half year master's program. Extremely humbling to be in the company that I was in. Just uh, incredible people surrounding me and other students and professors and just just quite incredible. But what I did find was that I was losing my interest in architecture per se. Um, just mm. uh, just the notion of you know uh, designing you know sculptures and plopping them into into uh, into places without true context. Um, there was no, there was very little meaning to it. And, and Harvard was very much about finding meaning, whatever, whatever we did. They didn't really teach us how to design. They taught us how to think about, uh, about design and about process. One day, I, you know, while I was at Harvard, I decided I'm going to go back and try a helicopter. I mean, I haven't been in a helicopter since I was in the service. Um, my wife actually gave me a present one year. And she said, um, you know, I, I, I scheduled you for a flight in a... Uh, aerobatics plane, and I was absolutely thrilled. So I get out into the field and wait. What's a what's an aerob what's an aerobatics plane? Just for because I don't know. Aerobatics plane is a plane that 
is okay flying inverted, basically can do loops and okay. barrel rolls and, and do all kinds of things that require you to, to, to wear a parachute because you might break something up there. <laughs> In fact, you're, okay. you're not allowed to fly aerobatics unless you're strapped in with a parachute on your back. And your wife, your wife loved you, right? <laughs> she said something about insurance, but I, I didn't quite catch what she meant. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so she got she got me a flight on this uh, aerobatics plane. It was a beautiful little red pit special. It was a uh, a red biplane, and and uh, the, the the pilot's name, if I recall correctly, was Gunter Eichhorn. He was a he was an MIT professor. And uh, he strapped me in. I remember him ratcheting, ratcheting him in, into ratcheting me in into the seat. Right, it literally took a ratchet to kind of ratchet me down, uh, very, very snug and tight. And we took off, and you know, he gave me the stick, and he showed me how to do maneuvers, and we're doing, you know, loops and barrel rolls, and everything is going very, very, very kindly. And suddenly, we he says, "Okay, we're going to do something that's called a hammerhead." And essentially, you pick up speed and you fly straight up into the sky until until you have no more forward airspeed. The, the engine is really struggling to keep up the, the, the pressure. And then at the last minute, when you start sliding down, tail down, you kick the rudder. And now you're facing, you turn around, or you pivot, and you're looking straight down into the ground as you, as you gain speed. Jeez. Now you're shooting down into the ground. And and uh, in, in skydiving, we used to call that moment ground rush. When you are very high up above the ground and you look down, nothing really moves. But the closer you are, the faster you, it comes towards you. So I'm starting to feel this ground rush as the, ra- rush, as the ground is kind of getting closer and closer. But at that moment, it's, it's amazing. Everything slowed down. Everything became really, really still. And I could sort of peripherally look around at the entire uh, uh, landscape. And I saw all these shadows cast from hills and the beautiful trees. And and the landscape took a form that I had never seen before. And we've all Mm. seen satellite images and all that kind of stuff. But actually seeing it in cinematic form as it came towards me became a two-dimensional but extremely three-dimensional at the same time and that was the point when i had my aha moment that said i don't want to do architecture anymore just architecture i want to do architecture in the context of landscape because landscape whatever it is whether it's a city or you know an urban setting suburban a beach an island it's what gives uh, meaning to that piece of architecture that genius of the site is what dictates the direction that the architecture should take all the uh, all the cues are taken from the surrounding areas in every tree every hill every rock every fence is taking cues from everything else i think about that and and a lot of people talk about you know gaining perspective changing perspective and they mean it usually uh figuratively but for you to have this very literal experience of changing perspective and what that did for you, I almost look at that. I'm like, man, how do, how does that, how does that sort of experience become more accessible? Like, how do we find ways to change perspective and have those moments if we're not helicopter pilots? You know, if we, if we, or not, you know, if we're not in an airplane. What an amazing experience to have. It's, it's. I got to tell you, every time I'm up there, I, 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 I literally count my blessings because it's. I have the opportunity to see the world in ways that most people can't see it. And I do it not because I have to, not because I might be forced to ride on a plane. It's, I, I do it by choice. It's, you know, some people like to fish, some people like to play golf. I like to see the world from a different place. And I like to see it at different speeds from different angles, uh, land in places that are completely inaccessible to the, the, the general population. So it just, it, it gives me a, um, uh, aside uh, to enjoy the world and enjoy beauty that is completely, completely different. But to answer your question, I don't think it's 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 necessary to be at 700 feet or 7,000 feet to see the world in a different way. Um, I think that we are very fortunate when we can stop wherever we are and look around and see mm-hmm. things in a micro and a macro kind of way and see the beauty in things, like whether it's, you know, just a, a, a nail that's 
sticking out of a board and seeing the shadow that's cast from that nail uh, or seeing a tree and, and the, the shadow that it casts. I mean, those the, the, the reflections off a building, if we can stop and just kind of enjoy that little moment for what it is and not see it like a postcard image, but see the, the grit and the beauty in, in little things. I mean, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And whether you're, again, up in a helicopter or, or five feet off the ground, it really doesn't make a difference. It's, it's what you do with what you see and how you appreciate what you see that counts. I love that. I think that's so true. The, this cardboard box dream, I have to ask, has that, I mean, do you still have that dream every once in a while? Uh, no, I only have, you know, I have the daydream of the dream. Uh, I don't have the dream itself, mm -hmm. but I, I, I remember, I mean, I daydream of that dream as if it happened yesterday. Wow. I can feel the, I can like literally feel the cardboard under my hands, under my arms, and I can feel myself sort of pushing myself forward to balance myself on the box. Uh, and I can feel my feet kind of coming off the ground and I can feel the, I can see the, the ground kind of moving under me. Um, it was a very comfortable, intuitive, um, it belonged to me moment. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's never gone away. There's a quote that I've heard you say that there's a story in every project. I want to understand what you mean by that. Uh, can you peel that back for us? You know, going back to the ground rush, going back to looking at the earth from above and trying to figure out how to bring architecture and landscape together, looking back to meaning, looking back to site and the genius of the site. Um, I think every project has DNA that needs to be infused into it. If it doesn't come with it, it needs to uh, allow it to be born. Um, if it doesn't have its own DNA, then it doesn't have an identity. It doesn't have a personality. So one of the first things, you know, I, I tell my clients, and as I talk to my clients, I say, well, what do you want this to be when, when it grows up? What do you want the project to be when it grows up? And if you can understand what the finished goal is, then you can sort of, like to, to use your words, kind of peel back and go back to the barest of essences, which is the DNA. And if we can establish that DNA early on, at that point, every further decision, every future decision that you make, whether it's architecture, landscape, interior design, or branding, goes back to that DNA. So what we do is mm -hmm. we, we, we grab as many elements from a project, uh, uh, as much information from a project as we can possibly gather. Then we distill that, all that information to the barest essence. And then we say, okay, the project is going to be moving forward about X. And we present that to the client and we make sure the client understands where we would like to take it from a, let's call it a genetic standpoint, from a DNA standpoint. If they understand that DNA and it resonates well with them, and very, most often it does, then every decision we take moving forward is, is not a subjective decision. It is purely an objective decision. So it's much easier for somebody to make a decision on something that is logical. It's kind of like a sheet of music. When, you, when you're listening to music, mm. even a song that you've never heard before, if you establish the tempo, the rhythm, the beat, the, 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 the melody, every note that comes can be essentially... Uh, a foregone conclusion. You you know where the music is going to go. Even if someone stops, you can probably hum, you know, the next few seconds. So that intuition is what we're tapping into. We want to make sure that as we develop a project, it becomes fluid and intuitive. Um, again, not objective, but uh, not subjective, but very much an obje objective, uh, fluid process. Well, I love that music analogy and how you know you're creating this kind of continuum that happens. That that is that is really interesting. You know, I, I actually, and I like the idea of, of establishing identity, that, that word. I actually have used that a lot, and I think it even goes beyond projects. It's almost like whether it's a, a, a branding campaign, whether it's a, a, a team, you know, like all good teams have an identity. You know, what is it that, that you're great at? What is, what is your identity? I think that's such an important word in creating purpose, and like you said, that kind of unwritten the unwritten rules that that guide our decisions um, are they in line with that identity 
it's true. And identity is gritty. Identity is imperfect, right? We, we, we keep in our office, we keep talking about beauty and imperfection because the fact is if uh, break it down to the dumbest of analogies, think about like a supermodel, right? You're not looking for perfection. You're looking for someone that has something that somebody else doesn't have. Uh, mm. or, you know, when you look at a painting, it's not just about a perfect representation of X. It's about the take on the representation of X, right? So you're looking for what is the angle? What is the personality? What is the nuance that you haven't seen? So if we can define that nuance at an early age of the project, then that nuance will only become more palpable with time. The trick is always corroborating that nuance. So making sure that once we establish the identity, we don't stray from it. A lot of projects stray from their identity. They bring whimsical attributes. They bring people that say, you know what, I want this project or this restaurant or this lobby to look like this because, you know, my house has that and I like my living room. And I always tell my clients, I'm not designing your living room. I'm designing the project. I'm working on the project because it has its own personality. And you need to, right. you need to, you need to make sure that that personality is what we're, you know, empathetically um, attribute to the neighborhood. We, we think about, you know, what is the locale? What is the region? Uh, uh, what is, where are the winds coming from? Where is the sun coming from? Where are the smells coming from? What kind of sand do we have? What kind of streets do we have? You know, everything is brought to bear. Uh, so it's no longer about this isolated living room somewhere, you know, in Manhattan. It's very much about the project and, and, and its own, um, as of right, identity. I have a few questions for you that I've written down. One is about your accomplishments, because you you have accomplished a lot, and you've you know you've run a successful business. Is there something out there that you haven't accomplished that's important to you? You know what's funny? I remember many many years ago, more years than I'd, I'd even like to admit to. But I had a I had a friend that asked me that exact question. And I was actually kind of shocked that she asked me the question. She, 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 she had asked me, you know, what I like to do. And I said, I like to do this and that and the next and the next. She's like, wow, you've done so much. Is there anything else that you want to do? And I, I was kind of shocked by that question because I, I figured, of course, of course there's other stuff that I want to do, but I couldn't think of what that could be. Hmm. I, I don't, I don't know right now. I, I don't know what else I, I want to do. Um, I don't know what else I, I it's, it's not like I move across, you know, the years thinking about what do I, what I want to accomplish next. I don't have that kind of, oddly enough, I don't have that kind of goals. I think, uh, I think the goals kind of come to me organically and I just kind of keep, keep going. Um, I think I just, I, I'm not good at stopping. I'm really not good at stopping. I'm, 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 I'm happy when I'm moving. I'm happy what I'm doing when I'm doing stuff. Um, so if I'm not, you know, if I'm not flying, I'm, I'm, I'm running or studying or, you know, doing something or diving or whatever, whatever it takes, but I, I can't really stop. Um, so I don't know what else I want to do. I, I really don't. I, you know, I, I love that saying, I'm not good at stopping. At first I was like, oh, that would make a great t-shirt. And then I was like, man, maybe that would make a great bumper sticker. And I was like, no, you don't want not good at stopping on a bumper sticker. <laughs> that could be a problem. Officer, but, I don't uh, know who put that sticker on my car. <laughs> yeah. But the this idea of you know letting your goals come to you organically, I actually think you're speaking for and to a lot of people because I, I'm I'm very similar. And and I think there's this kind of external pressure you know you whether you're into self-help or you're reading blogs or it's or it's new years right and there's all this you know pressure to kind of like uh, create goals and set those goals and have your bucket list and, and all that and and it could be a little overwhelming to try to do that um, but to think okay well you can really be a high achiever and and not sort of be so uh spend so much time thinking about, well, what's next? What's next? What's next? You know, um, that's kind of comforting. Yeah. I, I think, I think it goes into the realm of opportunity and I think it goes into the realm of, you know, what do you want out of your life and what do you want from the universe? Right. And if, if I know that the old cliche asks the universe, the universe will provide. 
It's true. I hate to break it to you guys, but it's true. I mean, if you want something and you want it really badly, you need to ask yourself to go get that. And, but you need to, you need to not stop yourself from getting it. Um, you, you know, one, one of the things that I always tell um, my employees and, and, and people that come to work at our office is make sure you, you, you have sticky hands, right? And every time an opportunity kind of comes your way, grab that opportunity because every opportunity that you see is becomes yours. And if you've done something a couple of times, suddenly you're an expert. Um, you could dodge the opportunity and say, you know what, I don't feel like it or I'm tired today or whatever. And guess what? That opportunity will fly right by you and the next person sitting behind you will probably grab it. And mm. as, as opportunities become amassed, that becomes a reflection of who you are. So the more opportunities you've, you've engaged head on and you've taken on and you've um, surmounted, right? Because each opportunity has its own challenges that be- makes you much more robust a person. So I think keep looking for opportunities is, is, is absolutely imperative. And this goes back to goals and opportunities and, and uh, uh, sort of alignment with yourself. What do you want to do? Yeah, I think, I think the sticky hands is just a great expression to kind of capture that. Is there other, other advice that you always make sure that your team is in tune with? You know, you have new hires, you have somebody you're growing and mentoring. What are, what are a few of the key things that have really helped you that you always pass forward? So the first thing that I look for in a new hire is passion. I'm not, I, 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 I never expect a new hire to have a tremendous amount of experience because, you know, experience is just time. Um, you, you learn from making mistakes and you learn from osmosis and from others and stuff like that. But, but enthusiasm is not something you can infuse on someone that is that comes across as unenthusiastic. If they're unenthusiastic, it's very hard to, to break through to them. So if you're enthusiastic about something, find out what that something is and go after it. If you are enthusiastic about design, architecture, landscape, interiors, be enthusiastic and go after it. Put those, you know, those sticky mitts on and, and go after every possible opportunity with tremendous fervor. Um, because that enthusiasm it's, is what's going to get you across the finish line. Um, when you go to a client and, and, and you present to a client, and I'm, I'm kind of skipping the foreplay and going all the way to the end here, but if you, if, you, if you go to a client and you go enthusiastically to show them what you have and you enthusiastically present a project and you tell them how beautiful it is and you tell them exactly how you're going to build it and you tell them what the cost is going to be and how much people are going to love it, the chances are that client's going to join in with you. They're going to drink the Kool-Aid. If you go to the client and throw something down and say, yeah, I kind of I kind of like this, but I'm not sure, chances are they're going to pass you by. So I, I think, you know, everything along the way of, of a new hire's career gets to that finish line of speaking to the client directly. And mm-hmm. you're only going to be able to speak to a client directly. And by that, I mean, reach them, right? Reach their, their inner soul for them to trust you enough to give you work if you have that passion and that enthusiasm for what you do. So as you come into the field, make sure you have, you are passionate about what you do and dial it up to 11. Just keep on plugging away at what you're doing and watch everybody around you. Because if you are the one with the enthusiasm and the sticky mitts and the sticky hands and grabbing the opportunities, you will fly much faster and much higher than anybody else around you. If you enjoyed today's episode, we would really appreciate a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. To discover more design stories, visit us at OFS.com slash imagine a place. From OFS, I'm Doug Shapiro, and you've been listening to Imagine a Place.